Uttamam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Dito Jayo Diriyat. Nishta Preshu Badresu Nityam Bhagavata Seva Bhagavati Uttama Shoki Bhakti Bhavati Naishtiki. Nikama Kapadura Garitam Param Shukama Karamita Dvavisamitam Pibata Bhagatam Rasamara Mahora Hora Sikha Bhavivakam. Krishna Sadamu Bhagade Dhamvigiri Karona Stadri Samasha Parana Kodin Oditam. Trauma Piyadavishita Vishkitam Vibhu Samyapriveri Nibiram Vidiksaram Pratyayida Hora Maranam Sankhaisu Nirvana Masanti Nanyataham. Jagva Saranam Charanam Bhujamare Vajana Bhagavata Yatra Kavavara Kovata Tambajatam Shadam Maham. He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinu Bandhu Jagatpate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Jayatam Saruto Pango Mama Mater Mater Gati Matsavasha Param Boja Radha Namada Namohanam Siman Rasa Rasa Dambi Vam Sivara Karsan Venashana Bhago Bhopinata Sri Sanaham Divyad Vrindaranya Kalpad Rumada Sri Madhradna Garashima Shanishto Sri Sri Radha Shira Govindara Prasadabhi Seva Manusham Rami Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmanya Taya Chaya Jagadi Taya Krishnaya Go Vindaya Namo Namaha Mangalang Bhagavan Vishnu Mangaram Gudajajam Mangaram Vaniri Kaksho Mangaraya Tano Hidi Om Narayanaya Vidmahi Vasudev Ayadi Mahi Vitano Vishnu Prachodi Atehe Maharakshmi Namastibyam Namastibyam Sade Sade Hari Pade Namastibyam Namastibyam Dhenai Dhenai Tapti Kanjana Gonigi Radhi Vrindavani Shari Vishavani Sute Devi Panamani Hari Pade Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Vishnaya Bhutale Shemari Bhakti Padanta Shami Dharmani Namaste Sari Sati Devi Gauravani Pacharini Nirvishesa Sanyavari Paskita Deya Sadhari Sri Krishna Chaitanya Parabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sari Govakta Vindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama. Hare Hare. Transcendental Tuesday. Yeah, I'm excited about our subject matter today. We're on our six, seven, eight. I believe this is part eight, discussing the pastimes of Gajendra. Thanks for joining me on Zoom. Rob by Bobby on Facebook, as well as Brent and uh, Shali as well. Appreciate you all. We learned from the Bhagavad Gita that there are four types of people who come to devotional service. Well, the last one which is mentioned is the jnani. Person is already a knowledge. They know the difference between the spirit and the body, and they would like to situate themselves 100% in their spiritual identity. Sometimes the example given of a field which may be um, have dry grass, it may have moist grass, or it may have wet grass. Now, if a spark falls on the wet grass, it will, it will extinguish right away. If the spark falls on the moist grass, it may ignite, it may extinguish. Could go either way. However, if the spark falls on the dry grass, it'll definitely immediately ignite. You'll have an immediately a flash fire, a grass fire. Now, some people, having practiced devotional service in their previous life, uh, have come to a higher level of consciousness. And in the current life, they pick up, hit the ground running, so to speak, where they left off. I've been trying to practice devotional service for 53 years. And in that time, I've seen a handful of people who a take to Krishna consciousness just as naturally as a fish takes to water. It means they come to Krishna consciousness more or less from a platform of knowledge. Knowledge does not mean devotional service. Knowledge does not mean initially, um, by definition, that you know about bhakti yoga. Knowledge starts when you understand aham brahmasmi. I am spirit, I'm not this body. From there, you begin to inquire about the nature of the spirit. And some people make the mistake of thinking that the, the spirit is supreme. God is spirit, I'm spirit, so I'm God. <clears throat> A equals B, C equals B, so therefore A equals C, <clears throat> which is not a fact. Nevertheless, the first step in transcendental knowledge is to distinguish between spirit and matter. And from there, one is meant to understand categories of spirit. Spirit is not undifferentiated, amorphous, homogenous. Spirit has its categories, just like in the material world. A tiger is very strong, 
and a rabbit is very weak. <clears throat> they're both animals, they're both mammals, but they're not in their, they're not interchangeable. They're not non-differentiated. Each one has their own strengths and their weaknesses. The rabbit can run faster than the tiger, but the tiger is more savage and more vicious, more of a killing machine. Just as there are categories of, in the material world, categories of living entities, categories of species, there are also categories in the spiritual world. Sometimes in order to make an effort, an uninformed effort to establish spiritual reality, we negate the material reality with which we're familiar. So we think that if spirit has variety, if, if matter has variety, if you see all kinds of varieties in the material world, then spirit must be without variety, without categories. It must be homogenous and differentiated. But Prabhupada says, you do not establish or approach spiritual reality <clears throat> just by negating material reality. It's not the process. In other places, it said, <clears throat> sorry for my voice. It doesn't seem to be reliable today. As I get older, more and more <clears throat> bodily fluids end up in my throat. <clears throat> which is frustrating to say the least. In any case, Prabhupada says in another place, matter is a dictionary spirit. And so if we see variety in the material world, then rather than negating variety to establish a spiritual fact, the better approach is to realize that the variety that we see in this material world is a drop in the bucket. It is a hint. It is the tip of the iceberg of the unlimited variety of the spiritual world of which the material world is only a sh shallow, pale, perverted reflection. I've, you've heard me use this example several times before. If it's hot, and it is hot during the days here in Utah, 93 million miles away from the sun, it's hot. <clears throat> Myself and Parama Purush went up to the Salt Lake City Temple early on Saturday. I was supposed to give the Bhagavatam class and the lecture, but I'd heard that uh, the grass, the land, the, the grass was somewhat unkempt. Um, when I got there, I found it was not as bad as what we thought it was because Brett had spent a couple of hours with his wife Jovana weeding and gardening there on Saturday. And Bhakti Thomas, very kindly visiting from Idaho, had taken the hand mower and mowed the two patches of grass immediately in front of the temple. So it wasn't as bad as had been reported, but the grass in front of the temple could stand another mowing. The grass around the ashram definitely needed mowing, and the soccer field in the back needed mowing. So I jumped on the ride mower. Arm Bruce went into the kitchen and helped them cut up and prepare for the feast, which Rasamrita organized. And incidentally, had a great crowd, about 100 people that night. Great kirtan, wonderful, wonderful program. Um, I got in the ride mower, so from about 4 o'clock till 5.30, I was out in the sun without any shade. And I am toasted. I am, I am toasted this morning. What's my point? My point is that if you can get toasted, on a Saturday afternoon on the ride mower by being out in the sun. And when I say in the sun, I mean 93 million miles away from the sun, not exactly in the sun. If I was in the sun, I wouldn't be here today to share things with you. But 93 million miles away from the sun on a July afternoon for an hour and a quarter, and I got toasted. Okay, now, would it be logical, considering this, to conclude that the sun is cold? Huh? Would that make sense? The, the, the logical conclusion would be that the sun is so much hotter if you go to the source. The closer you get to the sun, the hotter it's going to be. So the closer you get to the spiritual world, which is the substance of which this shadow material world is a perverted reflection. The more variety, folks. Hello, all you impersonalists out there. Hello, 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 hello. 
Jeev Jago Jeev, wake up to the fact that spirit is not the absence of matter. The absence of matter is the absence of matter. That's all it is. It's nothing. We're not nihilists. We're not voidists. Namaste Saraswati Devi. The specific mission of Prabhupada's guru, Bhaktisiddhanta, the baton of which Prabhupada accepted from him, Bhaktisiddhanta passed the baton to Prabhupada, Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani, is the application of transcendental knowledge to the question of the nature of the spiritual world, the result of which is to abolish philosophies of voidism and impersonalism in favor of the unlimited variety, the resplendence and the bliss of our real home, the eternal spiritual world. It's not surprising, therefore, that those who are in knowledge of the difference between spirit and matter and who desire to progress further in terms of transcendental knowledge are natural candidates for devotional service. And as I said, in my 53 years of being a member of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, I've seen a handful of people who took to Krishna consciousness like a fish to water. I remember back in 1980, 1981, we were doing the Festival of India in Southern California. And every once in a while we'd venture to nearby states. So we did a festival of India on the campus of University of Arizona in Tucson. We were there for two days, Tuesday and Wednesday. We had tents, exhibits. Uh, we had entertainment. We had a food, food concession. We had a little boutique. We would offer this free of charge to the campuses in exchange for a central location and the right to sell clothes and paraphernalia as well as have a serve everybody a lunch for a fee. Uh, uh, so we were Tuesday and Wednesday on the campus there. And he wasn't a student. In fact, he'd been living in a cave outside of town. Every once in a while, he had to come into town to get a few basic supplies. So living an extremely Spartan existence, most likely because he was reading books about impersonal philosophy. And he wanted not to be a part of the limited, temporary, dark, ignorant material world. So he was living in a cave. And he happened to be on campus the day that we arrived. And he spent all of the first day with us, all of the second day with us, um, asking questions, eating prasadam, doing whatever humble services were required. He helped us pack everything up at the end of the second day, Wednesday afternoon. And uh, as, as we Boarded, we had two trucks, two 20-foot rider, tr rider trucks. There was, there was room in the passenger seat and Madua's, the truck that Madua was driving. So he, he mounted up. He, he, he put one leg up on, into the, where the driver's seat with the door still open. He turned back over his shoulder and he turned his body and he faced this boy. And he said, are you coming with us? There was a moment of shocked silence during which he processed that request. And then he said, yes. He got up into the truck and he came with us and he became an exemplar, extraordinary devotee. He's lived the last, oh, I don't know, 30 years in Bhubaneswar. He's become an immense scholar of Vaishnav literature. He's an encyclopedia of knowledge. He publishes uh, Katam Rita Bindu, I believe it's called. He's often on YouTube. He has dozens and dozens of videos on YouTube, whereas he plums the depths, the nectar, the ocean of devotion in a way that hardly any other scholar or devotee can do. His initiated name is Madhavananda. And if I haven't done anything else in this life to serve Prabhupada and his guru in the civic succession, my life, I think, would be successful by having been instrumental in bringing Madhavananda. I probably wouldn't have even occurred to ask him to get into the truck. Madhua gets credit for that. But anyway, it was my, my program, <laughs> the Festival of India there. 
So that's one example that springs to mind. And there are a few others, but it's not common. So the one in knowledge is only one of four categories of being. The other one is someone who's inquisitive. Who are these Hare Krishnas? Why are they chanting? They seem to be free from sinful activities. Um, they are very blissful. They're bright faced. When I talk to them, they're not mere sentimentalists, but they seem to be grounded in deep philosophy. So let, let me, having encountered, having a chance encounter with the Sankirtan party in a public place, let me find out if they have a brick and mortar place and go along there and find out more. So that's the curious. Then there are those in need of money. They go to God, they put a dollar in the com, com, uh, collection plate, hoping that God will give them a hundred or a thousand dollars back. And he will eventually, provided you have the basic virtues of honesty and hard work. He'll, re, he'll give you the material desires of which you're covetous, but he won't give you himself. That's the problem. You want to take money from God, God will give you money. In the seventh canto of the Bhagavatam, desiring to reward Prahlad for his steadfastness amidst all kinds of tortures perpetrated by his father, the Shringi Dev, the half man, half lion incarnation, asks Prahlad, Prahlad, I want to give you some boon. You've been such a staunch devotee, in spite of being put in a pot of burning oil, in spite of being placed in a pit of serpents, thrown over a cliff, put under the foot of a, a war elephant, administered poison, having demons with tridents attempt to pierce your body. In spite of all of this, you've kept a good attitude and you've continued to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Please ask me some boon. Prahlad actually was offended. My Lord, I am your servant. And that's not a temporary role, temporary designation. I am your Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadhya. I'm your eternal servant. That's my constitutional position. That's where I find rest, peace, satisfaction, meaning, fulfillment. Why would I why would I want to horse trade, barter? my service to you for money. Why would I do that? I wouldn't make any sense at all. I've already established, I've already stepped into my eternal relationship with you. Raja Sevak, Sevak, I am the Sevak and you're Raja, you're my king. There's nothing, we don't need to muddy the waters. I don't need to pollute what's already a pure, well-defined ecstatic relationship. I'm not a businessman that I'm going to do something in exchange for a certain currency. I am doing what I do because it is who I am. It is who you've created me to be. You've created me to be an instrument of your, your work, your will, your mission for good in this world. And I am so happy, content to just go along with that and let you use me as I will. Why would I, why would I turn all of that into a business transaction? So those are those uh, briefly touching upon the four types of people who come to Krishna, those in knowledge, those are curious, those in need of money. And then the fourth part is the person in dukkha, the person in distress. And of course, that is Kajendra is our poster boy for coming to Krishna during a period of distress. Sometimes, you know, we, we go through. Sometimes Krishna brings us to Krishna consciousness very easily. The devotional service of our past life is immediately revived because we take birth in circumstances which are conducive to devotional service and the family of a devotee and the family of aristocratic Brahmins. We get the chance to just pick up immediately from where we left off. And sometimes we experience troubles sent by the Lord. And by going th through those troubles, by going through those adverse circumstances, we come to a higher level of maturity. We build up our character and we get Krishna conscious. It almost seems like Gajendra came to Krishna consciousness despite, in spite of his circumstance, because there was nothing 
about his birth that was conducive to Krishna consciousness. As a result, because two things are working, your karma, the natural laws, and then the supernatural laws. So sometimes they can go in tandem. Sometimes you may appear due to your karma, your bad choices of a previous life, um, to, to have been put at a disadvantage. There were two disadvantages that came with Gajendra's birth. The first was that he no longer had a human body, and it's generally only in the human body that we can think about who I am, why I'm here, and where I'm going. There was an exception made in Gajendra's case, whereby the potential was there to revive his consciousness of his previous life, but he was he was not as well situated as, for instance, Bharat. If you know the story of Bharat, Bharat was also a king in his previous life. He became an animal through no fault of his own in the next life. And he, but from the very beginning, one life he was a king. Uh, he he left his body uh, thinking of a deer. He took birth as a deer, but from the very beginning of his birth as a deer, of his lifetime as a deer, he was in full Krishna conscious. So that deer who had been Bharat in his last life um, associated strictly with the saints and sages in the forest. He would sit on the outside of the campfire with, you know, deers have big ears with his ears perked up and listen to the kata of the saints and sages. And of course, being very kind hearted, the saints and sages would leave the deer remnants of their prashada. Now, this is all because he retained his consciousness of his previous life as Bharat Maharaj. And he also retained the memory of why it was he had missed making his life successful because of the attachment to the deer. And so in his next life, he was very strict in avoiding attachments of all sorts altogether. That's his life as Jared Bharat. But uh, what Bharat and Indra have in common is that they both took birth in their next life as animals. However, the difference is that Bharat retained his consciousness from birth of his previous life. Whereas in Madumna, when he took birth as the elephant Gajendra, lost, at least it was covered. It was covered, the consciousness of his previous life as a devotee. And so while, while Bharat went through his birth as an animal in full Krishna conscious from beginning to end, um, it's, it's more of a challenge here. Gajendra seems to have to become Krishna conscious in spite of his birth as an animal. And that's the first disadvantage. And the second disadvantage is that he was the king. He wasn't just an animal. He wasn't just an elephant. He was the king of all elephants, uh, full of power. He, he was taller and broader and stronger and more handsome and more decisive and more generous. He was clearly the undisputed leader of all the elephants in the forest. And as such, he attracted the fealty, the loyalty of the elephants. He attracted the, he aroused the erotic desires of the female elephants. In her. So not, not only did he have going against him that he took birth as an animal and that his consciousness of his previous devotional service was covered, but over and above that, he was intoxicated with the opulence that come, came with being king of the jungle. And this is also a disadvantage in devotional service. Queen Kunti thanks Krishna that throughout the adolescence of her children and their early manhood, they were not blessed with lordship of the kingdom. They were blessed by trouble after trouble after trouble after trouble after trouble. So many were coming against the Pandavas that she had no wealth or prestige or good training or influence to fall back upon, to resort to in times of trouble. Her only option was to call out to Krishna. So similarly, Gajendra having been blessed with good birth, at least as far as the elephant standards are concerned, good connections, strength, good looks, at least if you're an elephant, you would have thought Gajendra was good looking. <laughs> These are all minuses. These are all demerits. These are all negatives for awakening your Krishna consciousness. So whereas Bharat went through an animal birth in full consciousness of his previous life and made his life successful, it is 
a little different in the case of Gurinder because he became Krishna conscious in spite. He had to overcome the twin disadvantages of taking birth as an animal, but also having lost, apparently lost, the memory of his previous life. And so it took a life and death situation. It took a huge crocodile. If Gajendra was the king of the elephants, uh, and in future segments, we'll tell you the story of the crocodile, but not right now. He was he was the king of the crocodiles. And he he was clever enough not to have gone on to land. Crocodiles, of course, are amphibians. They can they can navigate in water, they can also get about on land. But the crocodile was smart enough not to try to attack Gajendra when he was when he had all four feet on terra firma, but he was smart enough to wait until Gajendra was at a disadvantage in the water. And then with his powerful jaws, who knows how many thousands of pounds of pressure the jaws of a crocodile can exert, he, he clamped like a vice onto one of the legs of Gajendra. And a big struggle, big tug of war ensued. We've discussed this several times in previous episodes and Gajendra came to realize it dawned on him gradually as he became weaker and weaker and weaker day after day after day of the struggle went on it finally came to Gajendra I'm not going to win this contest and it was at that moment that he realized the limitations of his own strength that he plucked a lotus flower and then appealed to Krishna in his time of distress Arto those who are in knowledge approach the Lord, those who are inquisitive approach the Lord, those who are in need of money approach the Lord, and finally, those who are distressed are approaching the Lord. So the connection of one to Krishna, how one makes one's connection is through knowledge. How another makes a connection is through inquisitiveness, and how another makes a connection is desire for wealth. And some people make their connection to Krishna through distress. That was the channel. That was the path of Gajendra. He gave up his enjoying mentality, which was the cause of his bondage in the first place. In the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, 22nd verse, and it says, Purusha prakritishtohi bhunkte prakriti janganam karanam gunasangashat sada sad yona janmashu. How is it that an eternal spirit soul, part and parcel of God, this is a, a soda with stevia, Sweetened with stevia. Most sodas nowadays, if you look at the label, it's got like what, 68 grams of sugar. God, how can you put that in your body? But this is zero sugar and it's sweetened with stevia. <clears throat> it was through a life and death situation it was through a critical <clears throat> emergency that Gajendra was able to put aside his enjoying mentality. That tendency of the soul in material world to pretend to be the enjoyer is the cause of one's consciousness being contaminated and the result of contaminated consciousness is that sada sat yon janmashu, karana guna. We are the means of our own bondage. We basically tie ourselves up in the ropes of material nature because of our enjoying mentality. Fact is, we're not the enjoyers, we're the enjoyed. We're not the lords, we're the servants. As soon as you presume to be the master as soon as you presume to be the enjoyer you want to be the lord of all that you survey you want to be the sovereign that's the beginning of your downward spiral and as soon as you want to reclaim your position as a servant that's the beginning of your rehabilitation that's the beginning of your um, restoration going back to home back to god so in the time of crisis when none of Gajendra's good looks, none of his power, none of his position, none of his peers, none of the other elephants as big and strong as they were, were able to come to his aid. He realized 
that he was alone with the supreme personality of God in his heart. At that point, he awakened to his true nature. He awakened to his true consciousness. He put aside his pretensions to wealth and beauty and strength and power and royalty. And he just submitted himself in a mood of supplication, a mood of distress, and a mood of helplessness. Imagine this big, strong elephant, big as a mountain with multiple wives and children and uh, sovereignty throughout the whole jungle. Not a single animal can challenge him on land. And now he's putting aside all of those mental concoctions and in supplication, in humility, saying to Krishna, help. <laughs> and you know what happens as soon as he does that? As soon as the word help comes out of his mouth, there's a peace that descends upon him. In spite of the danger, in spite of the drama, you can imagine the soundtrack. It's, it's uh, gothic. It's medieval. It's, uh, it portends bad things. It's ominous. Everything, nothing, things couldn't be worse for Gajendra the elephant. And at that same moment, everything turns around from the internal point of view. And Gajendra has his epiphany. The, the spark, which had been so covered by the curse of the sage Agastya in his previous life, by his birth in untoward circumstances, and by his being diverted by the opulence of wealth and aristocracy, all that had covered the spark of his devotional service was now removed. And that spark now being fanned by distress, by difficulty, by him almost losing his life, those all conspired together or worked together to fan the spark of his devotionals. And he's feeling a, a deep peace, a deep rest in the midst of all that. He feels like I've come home. I was artificially striving against the, uh, the, the, the mother nature of this material world whose job it is to make uh, advancement difficult, um, whose job it is to dangle the carrot of material sense gratification in front of our nose. And as we move towards it, keep, keep it receding further and further so we never achieve the satisfaction that we hope to achieve through the interaction of material sense objects. What is that verse? I quoted yesterday. It said, uh, we have free will to make our own decisions, but we also have to face the reactions to the way we've been living. Sense and is fleeting and shabby. We do it over and over again, but it never makes us happy. Not knowing our true nature, we cater to all this temporary stuff, but it's never enough. We cater ourselves in this prison and numb our consciences, crummy position. We allow the media to condition us and we shop for addition to this body, which we are not. So Gajendra snapped out of it and he felt immediately a sense of, uh, having arisen to the real platform of self-identification, the real platform of self-realization. He feels now illuminated and warmed by the light which is um, emanating from the core of his heart where the Lord, the Parama, the super soul, our best friend is. And then he's thinking that, um, you know, he had a sense of satisfaction, a sense of complacency, a sense of smugness, when he moved through the jungle paths and everything seemed to be bowing down and deferring to him. But he realizes that was all illusion. That was all self-delusion. That was all hypnosis. That was all misleading. Now he feels, he feels fixed. He feels steady. He feels that he's in his real constitutional position, that I have awakened my sense of being a servant of the supreme personality of God. Otherwise, although Gajendra was the king of elephants, the animal kingdom is not a pleasant place. Gajendra had a little bit of latitude. He had a little, but even you can imagine Gajendra in order to achieve his supremacy must have had to have fought a lot of battles. If you've ever seen videos, of male elephants fighting with their tusks and bumping heads. It's a tough, it's a tough world out there. 
you know, for Gajendra himself, even to have gotten that position of uh, supremacy, uh, he must have had to have paid the price and blood and his body must have been scarred with the battles of numerous contests. Wherever you look in material nature, in the animal kingdom, the bird king, the reptile kingdom, um, the aquatic kingdom, the, the basic needs of life, eating, sleeping, mating, depending, are fulfilled under the most adverse, nasty, unpleasant conditions. The struggle for existence at every level in the animal kingdom is brutal. Nowadays in the modern world, um, most people are promiscuous, at least compared to the traditional standards that were accepted even 50 or 60 years ago. Most people are highly promiscuous and you have all kinds of promiscuous material available at your fingertip, on your phone, on your computer. Things that were unimaginable, things that were outrageous 50 or 60 years ago are now available. Uh, sometimes even children 10 or 12 years old find ways to access the, all the material there, which is meant to inflame our lusty desires. And as a result, we have a society in which 41% uh, uh, of couples get divorced. So many single parents, single moms, single pop, because of and even though we have advanced technology, we have birth control, we have we have uh, condoms. Still, the the unwanted pregnancies are greater than they've ever been before. And even if they carry the pregnancy through to termination, there's a great chance that the child will be brought up by a single parent. And many chances chances they desire to um, terminate the pregnancy, which is another. Nice way of saying killing their child who has taken shelter within the womb of the, of the child. So what is the karma? What are the ramifications that one will have to take one's next birth amongst the animal species of life? And fulfilling the animal needs in those species is a nasty, unpleasant affair. I'll give you some of our, my, the own examples that we've had just here on our property. We have 20 acres. In uh, it, 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 when we came here, we it was pretty rural. But in recent years, there have been housing developments all around us, and yet, nevertheless, there are some there are some uh, weasels. There are some uh, there are some porcupines. There are some raccoons that still have managed to live in the area in spite of the human development. So we had one hand, we don't know where she came. She just wandered onto the property one day, made herself at home. She seemed to get along with the peacocks and the parrots and everything. And she was older and she's quite shrewd. So as soon as uh, twilight would come, she'd always get high up in a tree. We'd come in the morning for Mangalarti and you could look up in the tree and there's Henrietta uh, 20 or 30 feet in the air. She was extremely, cautious one day i don't know what happened maybe uh maybe the varmint got crawled up the tree or maybe henrietta uh was you know a few minutes late and doing what she should have done but we just found her bones lying there somewhere no no grace no mercy no latitude it's cruel hard unforgiving unrelenting struggle for existence I'm sure all of you have seen the YouTube videos where an eagle swoop down and, and, and pick up a deer. What to speak of preying upon smaller animals like parrots and pigeons and doves. Eagles sometimes are so big and strong that they can even pick up a small deer and carry it away. Another example that we experienced here on the property was a few years ago, we had uh, two rabbits, a female and a male rabbit, and they had a litter of cute little babies and they were living in the haystack <clears throat> for the llamas and again one one morning we came up and it was just bones there previously there had been a nice cozy little family of mom mama rabbit papa rabbit little fuzzy cute baby rabbits and then because a raccoon had found them overnight uh, there was nothing left in the morning but bones yam yam vapish maran bo if that should happen to you, don't say that you weren't warned. 
Krishna warns in the Bhagavad Gita, yam yam, just as the air carries aroma, so the living being carries his conception of life from one body to another. You're going to get exactly what you desire. And so our message is be very careful about the quality of your desires. Because the human life, we're poised. If you do not at least make some effort towards understanding God and the purpose for which he put you here, if you totally squander this human form of life, you're on the edge of a precipice. Having achieved the human form of life and failed to capitalize on the opportunity that it offers, you in your next life, Krishna is warning you, if you make the wrong decisions, if you choose not to serve Krishna, but to serve your senses like an animal, then it's only due, fitting, and appropriate that you will take an animal's body in the next life. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. And so be very careful and be forewarned. If you, if you should, as a result of the promiscuity, which has become common, you know, you might think, well, everybody's doing it. So why should I worry? Surely there won't be any negative because everybody's doing it. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, everybody is going to take birth in their next life as a result of their present promiscuity as, as in, in the rabbit species who are very promiscuous, the pigeons are promiscuous, the mice are promiscuous, the, the deer are promiscuous. And we just talked about deers being picked up from above by certain species of eagles. That is the fruit. You sow the seed, you face the deed, whatever you do comes back to you. The law of cause and effect ensures the balance is perfect. Detecting whatever you do, it will resurrect. Death is not the end. It's just a bend. Whatever you've done will come back again. The body may die, but your karma standing by. You'll be reborn to live and die. Continue to suffer and cry. As the aroma follows the flower, as the heat pursues the fire, your karma will track you as soon as you leave the funeral pyre. Karma decides how you'll be reborn. Come when you're scorned, higher, humiliated, straight or deformed. Animal or human, sheltered or adrift. Karma is what makes the world go round. It's cause and effect right down there in the ground for those going over and around, up and down, bound by their deeds, drowned by their needs. Then the good news, the question arises, are we just, are we just doomed? Are we just fated to come back again and again and again and again? Is there any purpose to our life on earth? Is there any escape from the pain of coming back again and again and again and again? The good news is, yeah, because you're not the flesh, you're not the mind, your eternal spirit designed in the image of Almighty Divine, assigned to a service sublime, attracted by unselfish action, serving the Lord with dispassion, acting only for his satisfaction, devoted souls achieve extraction from karmic reaction. If you want to burn up your dharma, your karma, practice the dharma, pleasing the Lord, fashioned by his hand act according to his plan, and never, ever come back to this material world again. So the option is there. The choice is yours to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Choose the upward path. Choose the path of restoration, of revitalization of your original Krishna consciousness, following the footsteps of Gajendra, the elephant who revived his devotional service of the previous life. Otherwise, be cut, go back again into the great uh, blender of material nature where one living being is food for another. The law below the human form, the law for those who fail to take advantage of their Krishna consciousness is this, as stated in the first canto of the Bhagavatam, those who are devoid of hands are prey for those who have hands, those of devoid of legs are prey. That means your life ends by your being a meal for another living being. Those devoid of legs are prey for the four-legged. The weak are the subsistence of the strong. And the general rule holds, it holds that one living being is food for another. Our plea today is to avoid that fate. And the good news is that even a tiny advancement, even a little bit of advancement in Krishna consciousness saves one from the greatest danger. What is the greatest danger? Losing this human form of life and 
being cast down amongst the various species of life. Give up the false pretentious sense of being the enjoyer. Let's get fixed once again in our eternal role as servant of the Lord. Get blissful, get peaceful, get focused, get back to home, back to Godhead. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. <clears throat> Finish my soda here. Thanks very much again. Let's see. First on we had by Bobby, right from the beginning, from the invocatory prayers, the Mangalacharna, followed in short order by Brent and Shali. Thank you all. Jean, our Mr. Steady. Britta, second day in a row. Hare Krishna, love the background. <laughs> Isn't it great that in our mid to late 70s, we get so many youth come here and we get to explain the precepts of Krishna conscious to generation after generation <clears throat> of youngsters. <laughs> Britta, in, in, in connection with my example of getting toasted, 93 million miles away from the sun and Britta's red haired and she has a very like she's like by Bob the, the the northern European British Scotch and I'm from that too but I don't seem to have as light a complexion as by Bobby or Britta but those uh, first time I met by Bobby in Australia in 1970 before we met devotees practically within two or three days of meeting her we went to uh, I think it's called the Barrier Reef up near Queensville. We went just for a couple of hours with snorkels and all, and she got sunstroke. You know, we were on a little island somewhere. I forget what it was. And uh, yeah, there wasn't any doctor. There wasn't any clinic nearby. I think we spent the night in some sort of a shelter, an island somewhere up near the Barrier Reef. She, she had to drink a lot of water, and she was feeling nauseous and vomiting because of her northern northern european complexion and britta also has that same sort of genealogical background so she says i get toasted every time i go out in this weather be careful britta be careful just like by bobby wears a hat she wears long sleeve shirts and she did get melanoma she had a close call with melanoma probably around 1990 as well carmen you're becoming a regular thank you so much Hari krishna back to you and Govinda Dave, another regular, great human being there, saying, Hare Krishna, please accept my own obeisances. Carmen agrees with our observations about promiscuity, it breaks our heart to think <clears throat> of the future life of those who give in to the cultural laxity in that area. Stated crassly, Govinda Dave says, let's get our heads out of the gutter. So we turn to Rob for our, our takeaways. And also, let me say to those people on face, Facebook, um, Rob went on a camping trip for a couple of days last week. And I said, you guys will have to stand in for Rob. So Shali came up with a good quote for one day and Carmen came up for a good quote for another day. So if, if any of you on Facebook feel like the muse, if you feel like you want to rephrase anything poetically you're welcome to post it in your comments and i will also tack them on to rod's comments as well uh, rob is our official poet laureate but that's not to say that others of you um, are prohibited from trying to uh, capsulize our discussions as well i hope that makes sense so having said that let's see what nuggets rob has for us today Hare Krishna Prabhuji. And Wait yeah, no, I think it would be wonderful. Let me put it up. Yep. Sorry, Rob. Okay, I've got the sound up now. We can hear you. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Um, yeah, no, it would be wonderful to have others uh, doing this as well, because it. I, I'm sure more people have far more to say than I do. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say one way or another, but, you know, transcendental competition, it, it, it inspires <laughs> and challenges us all to go to the next level. <laughs> Teamwork. Yes, exactly. 
All right. Uh, it would be brazen and bold to say to say the sun is cold. <laughs> the types are four that seek the Lord. Nice. Our relationship with God is not a transaction, but unconditional attraction. Nice. Very nice. When placed in distress, you come to Krishna faster than the rest. Ah, right on point. And uh, material lust is a bust. <laughs> All good ones. All thought-provoking and very much to the point. Thank you for that, Rob. Please do send them to me. I'll look forward to posting them, as well as anything else that anyone wants to add or contribute from Facebook. And uh, yeah, this is the second of our three-part series for this week. I feel that Motivation Monday, Transcendental Tuesday, at least as far as I'm concerned, have been very edifying, very uplifting and informative because I'm listening to everything I say. So I'm learning as much, if not more than you all. And I look forward to finishing up the third part of our series this week, which will be the ninth time we've re revisited the pastimes of Gajendra. Tomorrow, Wisdom Wednesday. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare.